In today's lecture, we're going to talk about the reproductive system. We're going to discuss the male and the females, and for each of these, we're going to throw, focus on three main uh, um, components. And so we're going to focus on first the primary sex organs. And then after that, we're going to go ahead and we're going to go to the accessory sex organs. And then finally, we're going to make a link to genetics. And specifically, we're going to talk about something called independent assortment. So let's go ahead and get started. So what are the main components of the male reproductive system? We'll begin with the male, and then we'll move on to the female. Well, the first structure we want to talk about are the testes. And uh, the testis is basically a structure that produces sperm, which is the male reproductive gamete. And uh, the male can produce about 120 million sperm per day. So it's a very high quantity that uh, he can produce. These sperm retain their fertility for quite a while, and it takes about 24 days or so to make a fully functional sperm. Once the male starts to produce the sperm, there's going to be these little tubes inside the testes, which are not drawn here, so I'm going to draw them in, and they're called seminiferous tubules. So I'd go ahead and add those there, and this is the structure that I highlighted right here. So I'll just put ST, but go ahead and write seminiferous tubules, and you'll see this spelled on a later slide. But this is where meiosis occurs, so where male, males uh, change cells that are diploid, that have two of each chromosome number, and make them haploid, have one of each chromosome number. So we go from 2N to N something that we're going to cover, you know, as we go into our genetics lectures later in the course as well. But what I want you to note here is after that, the sperm has to pass through many, many different structures as it matures. So the sperm is going to pass from the seminiferous tubules into the structure here called the epididymis. And this is a structure that transports the sperm, but it's also a structure where the sperm further mature. After that, the sperm are going to pass through a structure, a tube called the vas deferens. And they're going to keep passing through that structure up here, Really that's transporting the sperm. And then after that, what's going to happen is they're going to enter into this structure that's called the ampulla of the ductus deferens. And it's right here. So they're going to go through here. Then what's going to happen after that is the sperm is going to pass through, you know, continue through these tubes, pass through a structure called the prostate, which we'll highlight right here, the prostate. And then finally, it's going to travel out the urethra, okay, and out the tip of the penis. That's the path of the sperm. Now you might say, okay, well that seems pretty simple. We haven't really covered much. And what to break it down in different parts though. So the first thing we did was just say, how does the sperm mature and what's the path of the sperm? So that's the first thing. But now what I wanna do is I wanna say, okay, what solutions um, are being picked up along the way? And so you could really think of it this way, that the sperm is the reproductive um, cell, right? It's the gamete. But really when a male ejaculates, he's ejaculating semen. So it's not just sperm. It's sperm plus a lot of solutions that have different components to them. And so we have to talk about what are these different solutions and what's being picked up along the way. So let's add that in now into this discussion. I'm going to change the color just to note that we're talking about now sort of components of the semen, you know, as opposed to just the sperm itself. So we're going to change, let's change to a blue structure here just so we could highlight this. Okay, so let's talk about a few of these different uh, structures here. So the first one I want to talk about is this structure right here, this bulbal urethral gland. And I'm not discussing them in the order in which they occur. And there's a reason you'll see why. But this is sort of the last one that happens. Uh, but what happens here is this bulbal urethral gland, which you see right over here, what it does is it's going to actually um, secrete this mucony, excuse me, this mucousy substance that precedes ejaculation. And really what's happening is you have this mucus passing through the urethra and coming out, and again, it precedes ejaculation. And what it's doing is it's clearing out any acidic traces of urine that may be there. Because when a man ejaculates and he urinates, it's coming out the same urethra, uh, you know, which makes sense. And so we have to clear that way to get rid of any acid that's still there from urine. Because otherwise, if, the, if that's still there, it could really damage the sperm and cause fertility issues. So that's why I highlight this bulbal urethral gland. I think it's an important one to note. Okay, now we're sort of backing up in the process a little bit. And the first uh, gland I want to talk about now is something called the seminal gland or vesicle. And this one really um, contributes a lot, right, uh, to, to the final semen product. And so what it does is it um, basically empties its secretions into the vas deferens before the semen travels to the prostate. Okay, so this is sort of the first main one I want to talk about. And really, the, uh, the seminal glands contribute about 60% of the final volume of semen. So there's a lot of solution that's contributed here. Let's talk about what's in, these, in this solution of these uh, seminal uh, gland uh, secretions right here. So there's basically three main things I want to talk about, and then I'll throw out some other things too as well. But the first one is it's secreting fructose. So I would add this in your notes, fructose. And what that does is it nourishes the sperm. The next thing it also uh, does is it uh, secretes prostaglandins. And I'd add that to your notes too. 
And what that does is that eventually will stimulate uterine contractions and help move the sperm along when um, the sperm is inside the female. Also what it does is, is it secretes a lot of other substances that I'll mention. So some that suppress the immune system in females to allow the sperm to enter in without being attacked. Uh, there's also substances that enhance sperm motility. Uh, there's enzymes um, that, you know, basically change the uh, fluidity of the semen in the end. Uh, and there's, you know, many, many other things as well. Um, in the end, what happens is uh, semen actually um, has this fluid that in it that will have this sort of yellowy tinge to it that fluoresces under a UV light. Uh, not that this is, you know, naturally something we care about, but really it's something that's used in crime scene investigations a lot. Uh, if you've ever watched a, um, you know, a crime show and you've seen that, what they'll do is if they're looking for uh, traces of semen, they'll shine a UV light on it and it'll fluoresce, right? It'll sort of give this fluorescent color. And it's really what it is is this fluorescence is due to these different secretions in the seminal gland. Okay, so we spent a lot of time on that sem seminal gland, uh, but it's very, very important. So I would triple highlight that, and if you missed some of those, I'd rewind the tape and you know, go ahead and listen to that again. Okay, something else I want to mention too then is as the semen's continuing to travel, right, as it passes through here, eventually what it's going to do is it's going to reach the prostate. Okay, and the prostate is something right here that we want to highlight. And what the prostate does is uh, contributes about a third of the volume of the semen. What it does is it specifically um, secretes something called PSA, or prostate-specific antigen. And what it does is this uh, helps um, basically clot and then liquefy the semen to help it pass in through, you know, into the female. Uh, PSA is also something that uh, will be monitored if a man uh, has prostate cancer or they're looking for reoccurrence of prostate cancer. So that's really something that's important to note for a few different, uh, you know, regards there. Okay, so everything I had in blue there is basically these are solutions that are being added to the semen. So I want to talk about one more thing. Let's change color one more time. Let's go to green. So it's sort of a different topic, right? But eventually what's going to happen is uh, we're going to talk about sort of two things. We want to talk about why are the male's um, testicles housed outside the body? seems like they're very uh, vulnerable to damage, right, which is the case. But the reason it is is because they're going to be housed in this scrotum outside the body, right? And the scrotum is this, you know, sac-like structure here. And really what the reason for that is is the testes survive uh, best about three degrees below the average human body temperature. So if we're talking in Celsius, the average human body temperature is 37 degrees Celsius. And really the testes, you know, are housed uh, much nicer at about three degrees cooler. And that allows, you know, the sperm to thrive. Um, if the male's um, testicles were internal, the temperature would be too high and it would cause an impact upon fertility. Okay. Some things to mention about the, um, the scrotum. Basically, it's a skin sac with superficial fascia, and there's two muscles there we want to talk about, and I would write these down. The first one's something called the dartos muscle, and this is the wrinkling that occurs in the, uh, the, the scrotum. The second one is called the cremaster muscle, and this is one that elevates the testes. And this is very important. Again, that three degrees below body temperature is really a crucial temperature. And so what happens is uh, if, if, if it's basically too cold, what's going to happen is the dartos muscle is really going to contract and really shrivel to pull the testes uh, to make the sac thicker, right? And then the cremaster muscle is going to contract to elevate the testes, bring them closer to the body. That's if it's too cold. If it's too hot out, the opposite is going to happen for both of those. The final thing I want to mention here is when we talk about, uh, when I talk about what happens when an erection occurs. And there's these two tissues that are in the shaft of the penis. Uh, one is called the corpus uh, cavernosum, and the other one is called corpus spongiosum. And these are the two right here. And what they do is they are engorged with blood when an erection occurs. And that's what gives a male uh, basically the erection. Okay, so you can see there's a lot of structures here that we talked about, but hopefully we could try to break them down into sort of three sections, if you will. The red being, you know, talking about sperm, right, its development and the path of the sperm. The blue being the solutions that are um, secreted into semen. And then the green sort of being the ends, uh, the odds and ends that are left, right? So talking about the scrotum and talking about the uh, tissue that engorges with blood when an erection occurs. Okay. If we go on to the next slide here, really what we're talking about is just a different view of, you know, sort of the same thing. So I just put that out there just so you could see that. But uh, again, we talked about all of this, but to give you a different perspective. Okay. Something I want to add on this slide that we did talk about on the first one, but that, you know, wasn't really shown are these seminiferous tubules here. And so I just want to note those. And so these seminiferous tubules, remember, these are those tubules within a single testes. Uh, and these are the tubules that what happens is um, meiosis happens there. And so again, what is meiosis? We're going from a cell that is 2N to a cell that is N. 
When we say 2n, we mean the cell has two of each numbered chromosomes. So for example, number one from the mother, number one from the father. When we transition to n, what happens is we have one chromosome from either the mother or the, or the father, and that's it. And then we have one number two, one number three, et cetera. So it's a very important thing that happens there. I just want to mention that because when we talk about genetics later on, we're going to really talk about this topic of meiosis a lot, and we want to make sure that you understand where that process is happening in the male. Okay, there's some other things we want to talk about here too. And whenever we talk about the testes being housed outside the body, there's a few things we got to consider here. And one of them is there has to be sort of this opening, and we call this opening uh, the inguinal ring, right, or the inguinal canal is another way to say it. And what happens is this is an opening on either side of the male's abdomen, and it's not external, right, so it's not external. It's not something that you could see outside the body, but it's internal. And what happens is uh, when you have this opening, let me change my color, let's go to red here. When you have this opening, it allows basically the vas deferens as well as arteries and nerves to pass from the body, right, towards the testicles. Uh, you know, going in both directions, obviously, sort of. But, uh, but that's what it allows. Now, that op that's what it's for, but the opening also leaves the uh, male especially vulnerable to something called a hernia. And what's happening in the case of a hernia, and there's different types of hernias, but sort of a classic hernia is where a male is exerting himself too much. You often hear about this with a male athlete, if let's say he's weightlifting or something. Or honestly, if even someone picks up a box that's too heavy. What could happen is that ring can open, you can actually get, and you see it right here, uh, you could actually get sort of um, this, the small intestine coming down into that opening. Um, it happened to a friend of mine in high school, actually, that it happened. And so he had to have it surgically repaired. And what they do is they put a mesh in there uh, to keep that small intestine from falling down again. And once you have uh, basically one of those inguinal canals fixed surgically, the odds of having a hernia on that side are almost zero. Uh, but, you know, it's something that uh, before you have that surgery, it's something that could really happen. And so that's sort of what we highlighted right there. Okay, we also want to talk about the process of producing sperm. And again, I mentioned on the first slide, I think, that it takes approximately, you know, 24 days or so. It's called spermiogenesis. And this is sort of what's showing what happens here. And so I want to sort of note that in the beginning, we have a cell that's going to be 2N, right? At the end, we have a fully functional sperm that's N. And just some structures I want to point out here. Uh, the sperm is the only cell uh, in humans that has a flagellum, and that helps with motility. Uh, the flagellum is composed of microtubules, those proteins. The sperm also has a ton of mitochondria in it because uh, you need a lot of energy to push that sperm around, right, or to paddle it around with that flagellum. But otherwise, what the sperm is is it's really just a packet of DNA, right? So there's DNA in there. And what there also is there, too, is there's this structure or this protein head at the tip of the sperm called an acrosome. And I would write this down. What the acrosome is is it's basically proteins and enzymes that help the sperm penetrate the egg later on uh, when you're going to have fertilization. And so that's sort of what happens. But again, you want to note that those different structures that happen and the different things that happen and the whole, um, the whole topic here is called spermiogenesis, right? It's the maturation of a sperm. Here's uh, actually some actual electron microscope images of a sperm, and they're color-coded, which is to show you what, one, two, three, four, five sperm in that picture. Uh, it's sort of neat to see, you know, what they look like. And again, the sperm is so much smaller than a human egg. Okay, so how does the spermiogenesis relate to this topic of independent assortment? I drew it on the last slide, but I just want to show you, this is a nice slide that superimposes both of these together. Uh, so remember, at the beginning, we have something called a spermagonium, right, and it's 2N, and by the time we get to, you know, fully functional sperm at the end, it's N, okay, 2N at the top. And this just shows you the process that happens as we go through this. So we have meiosis 1, we have meiosis 2, and eventually we end up with, from one precursor cell, we end up with two fully, or sorry, excuse me, we end up with four fully functional sperm at the end. Okay, so now let's go ahead and focus on the female reproductive system. Okay, so let's go ahead and continue uh, discussing the female re reproductive system now. So again, it looks very complicated. There's a lot of different, uh, you know, structures that are part of the system. But what I want to do is sort of break it down and talk about, you know, different, different parts that you could associate together, basically. Okay, so let's begin with the uh, external female genitalia. And so here we have two different things that are called lips. 
These are the outer folds uh, of the female reproductive system. Uh, the larger of the two is called labium magus, and the other one is called labium minus. As you get to this uh, structure here, okay, the structure here we call the vagina, this canal here we call the vagina, uh, this is where the penis will enter, and this is where the child will leave later on when you talk about sexual intercourse and you also talk about childbirth. At the entry point of the vagina, you're going to see a fold here called the hymen. And the hymen is something that is usually unbroken uh, prior to intercourse and usually breaks after intercourse. Uh, traditionally, it was used as a, a structure to tell if a female uh, was a virgin or not. But nowadays, honestly, we know that, uh, yes, you know, sexual intercourse does usually break the hymen, but there's many, many uh, activities that could also break the hymen. So, for example, if a female is an athlete, uh, you know, she's stretching a lot, uh, that can rupture the hymen, or it could just break naturally on its own. So just to clarify, the hymen is not really a good structure to tell if a female is a virgin or not. So that's something that traditionally was thought to be the case, uh, sort of like a wives' tale, honestly, but today we know that's not a valid statement. Okay, so let's continue on here and talk about some other structures here. So um, if we go just anterior of the vagina, we'll see that we uh, have a few different structures here. So here we have the opening to the uh, urethra, right, where the woman would urinate. Up here is her urinary bladder. Again, not really reproductive, but just want to point it out so we know, you know, different perspectives here. If we go anterior to that, we have a structure called the clitoris. And this is the structure right here that gives um, the female pleasure during sexual intercourse. So really it's responsible for sexual arousal. Okay, if we continue, uh, you know, looking at this here, let's start talking about some of the more internal female genitalia and specifically what makes a female a female. So here we have the presence of the ovary, right? And the ovary here is the structure that's going to produce the egg. And really there's uh, an outer portion to the ovary called the cortex. There's an inner portion called the medulla. Probably seem very familiar after we talked about the kidney already. But let's go ahead and talk about this a little bit more. So the outer cortex is what basically where you have this developing um, gamete or this oocyte. The inner portion is where you have a lot of large uh, blood vessels, nerves, lymphatic vessels. So in the outer cortex, as the oocyte is developing, it's going to develop in these sacs that we call follicles. And what's going to happen is when a female uh, reaches reproductive age and starts to have her period, what's going to happen is every month one of these follicles is going to rupture and basically an egg is going to be released. And that's, again, all happening in the ovary here. And it's sort of interesting because what we want to realize is that it's happening in the ovary. And if you were looking at the ovary of a young woman, before this happened, it would be very smooth. As a woman ages and every month she's releasing an egg, what happens is the ovary starts to look very pitted. Okay, the next thing that's going to happen is these structures called fimbriae, uh, basically these finger-like projections here, are going to guide the egg from the ovary into a structure here called the fallopian tube, or we can also call it the uterine tube. And that's going to begin the path of the egg traveling uh, basically to the uterus. If pregnancy is going to occur, typically the sperm will meet the egg in the fallopian tube, okay, so that's where pregnancy occurs. And really, uh, you know, then the egg's going to continue down into the uterus and via a process called peristalsis, which you've seen many times before. So you have these ciliated, um, um, sorry, simple columnar ciliated epithelial cells. They're going to be guiding uh, the egg throughout the uterine uh, tube or throughout these fallopian tubes. Okay, so let's go ahead and keep talking here about these different structures. Here is sort of, again, one of the main reproductive structures of the internal female um, uh, reproductive system. And this structure here is uh, the uterus. And the uterus is where you're actually going to house the child when the child's developing. We're going to talk about that much more later on. Uh, there's an opening to the uterus called the cervix. And this opening here is something that is uh, really monitored when a woman is about to give birth to a child. They always say, how dilated is the woman? And really what they're looking at is how dilated is her cervix. as an indication of when the child will, uh, you know, is about to come. Uh, if the female's not receptive to being pregnant, if her body's not receptive, you know, it's not the appropriate time for her to be pregnant, that um, cervix is going to be very thick and very mucousy, and it's going to block the sperm. Okay, just a couple other structures I want to talk about before we go on to the next uh, slide here. And so really we have another structure here at the bottom left called the greater vestibular gland. And what this is, is this is a gland that is going to release a mucousy substance that lubricates the vagina uh, during intercourse to make that possible so it's not a painful activity. And finally, also 
I don't think it's on the slide here, but you'll see a term called vulva. I'll sort of write it on the side here. You'll see a term vulva uh, that's often used in association with the female reproductive system. And what the vulva is is really it's the just the word to describe all of the female external genitalia. Okay, so we're going to move on to some different perspectives here. So we covered most of the structures here, but I just want to show you this perspective here, sort of an anterior view of the female reproductive system, whereas before we had a uh, lateral view. And uh, I'm not going to talk much about this, but I just wanted to sort of note all the structures we saw on the previous slide and see if you can relate them to this slide. The same goes for this uh, view, too. So this is an inferior view of the reproductive system. And really, again, I just want you to note all the different structures we talked about on the first slide and see if you can identify them on this slide. Okay, so now we're going to go and talk about sort of the events that happen every month when a woman is having her menstrual cycle. We're going to talk about what happens uh, when she is, do, does not become pregnant and when she does become pregnant. So let's go ahead and take a look at this. Whenever we talk about the menstrual cycle, really what we're talking about is two cycles. And I just want to sort of mention that because I think we often just think of the menstrual cycle itself. But really there's two cycles, and they're divided here. If I draw a line right across the screen, they're divided right here. So on the top, we have something called the ovarian cycle, right, which is this cycle here. And on the bottom, we have something that we call the menstrual cycle. Uh, and so, or, or a different way to say it actually is the uterine cycle. And so I just want to note that really it's two cycles in one, right? The ovarian cycle and the uterine cycle. So let's focus on the ovarian cycle at the top here. And so uh, with both of these cycles, what happens is, uh, you know, you have fluctuations of different uh, gonadotropin levels or different hormones. So two of them uh, specifically are going to be the follicle-stimulating hormone and the luteinizing hormone. And what's going to happen is those are going to change, right? You're going to get peaks of those at the middle of the cycle. And this is sort of the progression that happens if we look at this next chart here. So really what's happening is you have sort of a follicle, right? You have two phases, actually three phases of the ovarian cycle. Uh, two sort of main ones, and the third one is just a big event, but it's just like a day that it happens. So the three phases are this. You have the follicular phase, the ovulation phase, and then the luteal phase. Now the whole cycle lasts about 28 days, so almost a month. And what happens is in the follicular phase, what, what you're having here is you're having sort of uh, the maturation of this follicle. And then what's going to happen at the second phase here at ovulation is that follicle is going to rupture and you're going to have an egg that is released. That's ovulation. So that's just sort of like a one-day activity that happens. Then after that, you're going to have something called the luteal phase. And in the luteal phase, you're basically going to have... Um, well, two things you could have happen. So you're going to have something called a corpus luteum, right, that is either going to start, you know, um, if, it, if fertilization does occur, it's going to start maturing. But if it doesn't, what's going to happen is it's going to start degrading. And so here we have basically uh, what this picture sh is showing you right here is when fertilization does not occur. So you want to just note that in your notes when it does not occur. Uh, if it does occur, there's sort of a slightly different path that happens here. But really what happens is, you know, if there's no fertilization, we get degrading of the corpus luteum. And then what happens is uh, basically it turns eventually into something called a white body. And if, if you never get fertilization, it degrades into something called a corpus albicans. Okay, but let's start focusing on the bottom cycle here. So on the bottom cycle, we have the uterine cycle. And again, there's, you know, fluctuations in hormones here, estrogen, progesterone that are changing over time. Uh, again, the fluctuations of hormones you're seeing right here is if a female is not pregnant. So if she becomes pregnant during this time, uh, this, these hormone levels would change. This chart would change a little bit. So I just want to note that. Okay, let's go ahead and look at the bottom chart here now. Let's look at the, um, the uterine cycle itself. And there's three main phases to the uterine cycle. And I just want to uh, note that you could superimpose this bottom chart on the second from the top chart, the one that has the uh, ovulation, follicular phase, luteal phase. They superimpose on each other. But we separated them so you could view them. Okay, so there's three main phases. There's the menstrual phase, lasts about five days. There's the proliferative phase, and there's the secretory phase. So we always start uh, the uterine cycle, right, on day one of the menstrual phase. And this is the phase when the woman is um, shedding the functional layer uh, of her endometrium. And so what's happening here is this is when the woman is bleeding, uh, pregnancy has not occurred, and basically she's, you know, getting rid of the egg, right, and she's shedding this functional layer of the endometrium. After that, what happens is the woman's body is preparing for pregnancy again in case it were to happen. 
And so what happens here is you have the proliferative phase, and you're getting rebuilding of that functional layer of the endometrium. That's what's happening here. I want you to note that the menstrual phase, the proliferative phase, basically are what happens. They correspond to the follicular phase uh, on this, um, this top cycle here, on the ovarian cycle. Then what happens is we go on to the secretory phase. And this begins immediately after ovulation. So this corresponds directly to the luteal phase uh, on that top chart. And what happens here is basically the endometrium is continuing to build. We get uh, a lot of enrichment of blood supply in here. Um, we get a lot of secretion of nutrients. And basically, you know, the woman's body is getting ready to, you know, receive um, that embryo. And if it's fertilized, develop it into a child. And so really what happens is that. Now, if uh, fertilization does not occur, then what's going to happen is, you know, that layer is going to start to degrade, and then we're going to come full circle and go back to the beginning of the menstrual cycle here. So again, I just want to note that what happens here uh, is on this page is always showing you what happens when a woman does not become pregnant. So it's literally showing you the cycle, right? If a woman were to become pregnant, we would exit out of that cycle. Okay, so let's continue on to talk about something called oogenesis. And this is akin to sp uh, spermatogenesis, which we talked about in the male. And in oogenesis, what we have is literally we're saying, okay, let's talk about how the female turns a cell from 2N, right? And we go all the way down, and she turns it all the way into N, right? So 2N being two of each chromosome, N being one of each numbered chromosome. And really the thing I want to note here is a few different things. But what I want to note is that we start with this oogonium, right, this stem cell. And what happens is from one ogonium, we're actually going to end up with one egg, and that's it. Uh, the other um, um, cell divisions here revo result in things that are called polar bodies. And the reason really is, is because the egg requires a lot of nutrition, a lot of cytoplasm. So whenever we're getting a division along this uh, path here, it's an unequal division. And so one of the future eggs, if you will, is hoarding all the resources, all the cytoplasm, and the other three eggs that should have developed, if you want to think of it in that sense, become polar bodies and they get degraded by the body. Okay. Uh, the other thing I want to note here is that we can look at the follicle, right, in the ovary over time that happens. And again, what happens is uh, in the absence of fertilization, this ruptured follicle is going to degenerate, right? Uh, it's going to become something called a corpus luteum and just degenerate and, you know, and go away, basically. Okay, after a woman gives birth, we want to talk about some other uh, sort of secondary sex, uh, you know, characteristics that, that happen or events that happen. And so really this revolves around the topic of milk, milk production in a woman. And so what we want to note here is that um, this glandular structure that I'm about to show you is very undeveloped in a non-pregnant woman. But when a woman becomes pregnant, that's when you have all these structures really start to develop. And what happens is you get this milk production. Now, it's sort of interesting. A lot of people don't realize this until they have children, but milk production does not start like, boom, right after the child is born. Uh, the first few days, what the woman releases is something called colostrum. And what colostrum is, is colostrum is referred to something as liquid gold. And so on the left, you have colostrum. On the right, you have actual breast milk. Uh, and uh, it's often disheartening to young mothers because they'll have like almost you know, no release of milk the first day or so, but they're releasing very, very small amounts. They not, might not even notice of this stuff called colostrum. Uh, and they often wonder if it's enough for their child to survive. And it is, though, because the colostrum is highly, highly nutrient-packed, very protein-rich. Uh, and so they, literally that's why they call it liquid gold uh, because it's enough to give the child nutrition even though it happens in very, very small amounts. Now, eventually, the breast milk will kick in, and then that's when we get this milk that we would think of as a more typical you know, milk color. Okay, if we look at the, the female breast to talk about the different structures that are here, uh, we'll have this um, sort of darkened area here that's called the areola, and in the middle of that, we'll have the nipple. And at the tip of the nipple, you're going to have all of these openings, right, uh, of these lactiferous ducts where the milk comes out. So it's not a single opening, but there's many, many pores which the milk will come out. So when you think of the milk exiting, um, uh, you know, a mother's breast, it's not like a bottle where you have a single opening, but there's many, many pores where the milk sort of oozes out of. Okay, some other things we want to note here is that if we're, we're working backwards now in terms of the pathway of milk, but the milk will be stored in things called uh, lactiferous sinuses, and they'll travel through things called lactiferous ducts. 
And what often happens is once a mother starts breastfeeding, she needs to continue breastfeeding at a fairly regular pace. Uh, if she starts and stops and starts and stops, what happens is she might get accumulation of milk in these sinuses, and it can become quite painful, actually. And, and what can happen is, uh, you know, the milk can actually get sort of backed up, and, it, you know, it takes a while to, to reverse that, that symptom. So, so once uh, someone breastfeeds, they want to keep uh, continuing to breastfeed at a regular pace until they're deciding that they're done breastfeeding. Okay, something else we want to mention here, too, that um, the areola region here actually has a lot of large sebaceous glands here. So a lot of large sebaceous glands. I would write that down. And they produce this substance called like an oily sebum. And this minimizes chapping or cracking of the breast when a mother is breastfeeding. So it's quite a complicated process. There's a lot going on. It's not as simple as, you know, one might think maybe. Okay. So the final thing we want to talk about when we talk about reproductive systems is we want to talk about uh, what you know, disorders can happen. And so let's start with the males again. Uh, in males, we could have testicular cancer. cancer. Uh, it affects about 1 in 50,000 males. Um, and uh, it happens at a very young age, actually. So most men that are affected by testicular cancer, it happens in their early 30s. Um, there's an increase over time that we're not quite sure why this is happening. But uh, if you're going to get a cancer, not that anyone will want to ever have cancer, but testicular cancer is one that is highly curable, so about a 95% cure rate. Now, what men will often do is if they know they have testicular cancer and they're going to get treatment, before they get treatment, they might actually um, donate some of their sperm, not donate, but they might store some of their sperm at a sperm bank in case they want to have children later on. Because often um, when someone has testicular, testicular, excuse me, testicular cancer, what happens is uh, there could be fertility issues later on. So if men do want to have children, uh, but they have testicular cancer first, they will bank their sperm at a sperm bank for later use. Another type of cancer that can happen in males in the reproductive system is something called prostate cancer. It's a very slow-growing cancer. Uh, and uh, again, how do we know that or how do we monitor that? We look at someone's PSA levels, their prostate-specific antigen levels. When they start to peak, it could mean they're at risk of getting prostate cancer or it could mean they're at risk of having reoccurrence of prostate cancer. What are the risk factors? Well, fatty diet, uh, and there's always a genetic predis predis excuse me, predisposition, obviously, uh, depending on you know, the genes that someone carries, the versions of the genes they carry. Okay, so what are some uh, you know, abnormalities in the female reproductive system that can occur? Well, again, cancer is a big one, right? There's ovarian cancer, which is a very serious cancer. Uh, the cure rate is not as high as we would like on that. Uh, there's endometrial cancer, right, arising from cells of the endometrium, that layer that's continually shedded of the uterus. There's cervical cancer, right? It's a very slow-growing cancer. Uh, it arises from the cells of the epithelium at the tip of the surface, uh, cervix. Uh, and often it's caused by human papillomavirus. And there's actually a lot of vaccines out now that are HPV vaccines that young women can take, um, you know, in their early preteen years uh, that can help, uh, you know, help reduce the risk of cervical cancers in them. And then finally, there's breast cancer, which is something that, um, you know, most of us are very aware of. Uh, it's the second most common cause of cancer deaths in women. Uh, but the thing that is, you know, very promising is that there's a very high uh, cure rate uh, as time goes on. And so we're getting a lot of nice um, measures to deal with this the best we can. Uh, there's obviously, uh, you can remove the mass itself, which is called a lumpectomy. Uh, you might have to move one or both breasts, which is called a mastectomy. There's radiation treatment, uh, there's hormones that can be given, there's chemotherapy. Uh, so really it's something that we're, uh, you know, highly aggressive in terms of treating nowadays. And the, uh, the success rate in terms of uh, having remission is often quite high uh, in many forms of breast cancer. And this is basically showing you a, uh, pre not a preventative, but a detective technique, uh, a way to detect breast cancer early on in a female, something called a mammogram. And you can see by using this technique, uh, I think they recommend women, um, you know, by the age of 40 that they're going, you know, at least every year, every couple of years to get this technique done. And what you'll see is you'll see the malignancy, you know, crop up here and you'll see it very obvious and it's something that could be treated. Okay, as always, make sure before you proceed to the next lecture that you have a, you know, fairly solid understanding of all the different concepts we've talked about in the male reproductive system and the female reproductive system. Um, if you're unsure of anything, please let me know. Make sure you can explain it, right? We don't really want to say just understand, because understand is how do you know if you understand. The way you know is if you can explain it to a friend in the course. 
So please make sure you can explain all these terms and then uh, go ahead and proceed to the next lecture.